I'm Robert Anderson and welcome to The Tourist Route. In this episode, we're visiting Seville, located in the south of Spain in the Andalusia region. Seville has been on my travel bucket list for a long time, and Ryanair has a very affordable flight from Edinburgh in Scotland, my hometown. So one July morning, I enthusiastically jumped out of my bed at 4am, got to the airport, had a wake-me-up coffee, and boarded the 6.20am Ryanair flight to Seville. A flight at silly o'clock in the morning is never pleasant, but everything from security, boarding, and the flight itself went really smoothly, and we arrived on time, including my luggage. So after a quick walk through the airport, I headed for a taxi so I could start my Seville adventure. Taxis charge a standard 25 euros to and from the airport. There is also a frequent bus service, which is four euros into the city centre, and Uber is also available. I have a full itinerary for Seville, which includes an amazing lineup of key landmarks to explore over three days. It may not have everything you can possibly do, but from what I've researched, I hope this video gives you the key places to go when visiting this historical Andalusian city. My first stop is Real Alcazar. Now you might be wondering if I'm about to meet a wizard, but it's what they call the Royal Palace of Seville. The Real Alcazar is a designated UNESCO World Heritage Site and is the oldest European working royal palace. So when the Spanish royal family visit Andalusia, this is where they'll stay. It was built in 914 as a Moorish fort, but it has changed hands quite a few times over the centuries. Although you can see that the decoration is unmistakably Islamic, it also has Gothic, Renaissance and Baroque influences, which combined makes this such a stunning building. My only wee criticism is that the rooms all felt quite empty and seeing more furniture or artworks might have helped tell the story a little bit more. The gardens certainly feel very royal and are beautiful to walk around. They are lush with greenery and water features and there is plenty to explore there. Also, for all you Game of Thrones fans, you might recognise the gardens and some of the palace as the Kingdom of Dorne, which was used throughout the series. Afterwards, there is a restaurant here where you can get a well-deserved cold drink, and you may even make friends with a peacock or a duck. When visiting the Real Alcazar, I strongly suggest you book in advance. The line, as you can see here, gets very long, but if you book online, you can bypass this by choosing a time to go. I would also suggest buying the audio tour, which is an app for your mobile, or join a tour where you'll get a proper guided overview. It is a big place and I got lost a few times. I also suggest visiting early morning or early evening. I went in the afternoon on the hottest day of the year and I was a tartan puddle by the end of it. Also, if you're like me and rely on Google Maps when traveling, if you type in Real Alcazar, the location pin is in the middle of the gardens, which you can't get to without going through the entrance. Google Maps seems to get confused and takes you to a dead end, which is outside the university building, which you can see here. The facade is very beautiful and certainly worth a look, however, it's still 10 minutes from the Real Alcazar entrance. To find the entrance, enter Puerto de Leon, the Lion Gate, or search for the Plaza de Triunfo and you'll get straight there. My recommendations are, book online before you go to avoid the queue. Aim to go early morning or late afternoon, definitely in summer. Expect to spend two to three hours here, including the gardens. Buy the audio tour or join an organized tour. If using Google Maps to find your way, aim for Puerto de Leon or Plaza de Triunfo, not Real Alcazar. There's a cafe and toilets on site, and look for deals using a Sevilla tourist pass.
My next stop was the cathedral, as it was literally across the plaza from the Real Alcazar. The cathedral is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site and was built in 1519 and is the largest Gothic cathedral in the world. Only St Peter's in Rome and St Paul's in London are bigger cathedrals. It dominates the Seville city centre and whether you're religious or not, it's a must-see for the external detail, the architecture and the ornate decoration inside. There is a lot to see in the cathedral as they have many displays and artworks on show which are really interesting. Remember to check out the rooms which are near the back. One of the most interesting facts about the cathedral is it has the final resting place of Christopher Columbus, the famous Italian explorer who discovered the Americas. His remains have moved a number of times over the centuries, but came to Seville in 1899. His tomb is held up by four kings and looks very impressive. There's an interesting story about his remains that you can look up for yourself, but I think his tomb is an amazing monument to him and his achievements. Also, if you're wondering why an Italian is given such a high honour in a Spanish cathedral, it was Spain who funded his trips to the Americas. La Giralda is a cathedral bell tower, and yes, you can indeed climb up it. The site of the cathedral was originally a Moorish mosque, and the bell tower was the former minaret of the mosque. It's a 104 metre steep climb, but not by staircase, but a large winding ramp which was to allow the Sultan of the time to be able to ride up to the top on his horse and enjoy the views. The climb is steep and dark in places and there is a small staircase for the last 10 metres but you are rewarded with a stunning view of Seville at the top. It's a very popular attraction, so it can be a bit of a squeeze to move round, and please be mindful that you are going to be under the bells, which do ring on the hour and are quite loud. My recommendations are buy your ticket online before you go, as it will be slightly cheaper. I'd expect to spend one to two hours here, including the La Gralda Tower. The La Gralda Tower is a steep climb, but worth it for the view. There is an audio tour and guided tours available. There are portable toilets on site. And again, look for deals using your Sevilla Tourist Pass. From the cathedral, I walked down Avenue de la Constitution, over Puerto Jerez Square and the Hispalas Fountain, down to the Place de Cristobal Colón, and to the banks of the beautiful river Guadalquivir. Here you will come to the iconic Toro del Oro, or the Tower of Gold. This stunning monument stands proudly on the banks of the Guadalquivir River and has captivated visitors for centuries. Built in the early 13th century during the reign of the Alafmad Caliphate, the Toro del Oro served multiple purposes throughout its rich history, such as a watchtower, a port authority, and a prison. As you approach the Toro de Oro, you'll see its distinctive octagonal shape and its Moorish architecture. When you enter, you will make your way up some narrow steps and have the option to explore the Naval Museum of Seville, which showcases the city's maritime history, showing paintings, navigational instruments and historical artefacts. The museum is fairly old school by today's standards, but the history of the tower is interesting to read about. The highlight, or so I thought, was to climb to the top of the tower to see the views over the river and the city. However, unless you're 6 foot 6, the turrets will block your view and you can't see very much, so I was left a bit disappointed. There is a suggested donation of 3 euros for entry. I'd expect to spend 30 minutes to 1 hour here. There is a steep climb to the top and there isn't a lift. There are no public toilets on site, 
and the view from the top is restricted but you can climb a little bit higher to a ledge which can have about two people and you do get a better view from there. I decided to board the hop on hop off bus which was 25 euros for a 24 hour pass. I love a city bus tour as when you're struggling for time you can make sure you see all the main sites and they'll take you directly to them. I really wasn't on it for long as the first stop was the Plaza de España, located in the Maria Luisa Park. Passing by the waiting horse and carts, you come to this picturesque space, which was a small river, a large tower building and a plaza with an impressive fountain in the middle. It was built for the Ibero-American Exposition of 1929 and has beautifully decorated tiled areas representing each Spanish region. The area has no real purpose but to be enjoyed by locals and tourists alike and the building is used for local government offices. It's a stunning space and is perfect stop for a picnic, a leisurely walk and even a horse and cart ride. I walked along the Maria Luisa Park to the Plaza de Americas, only 10 minutes away. The park is great for a stroll if you have some time. But there wasn't really much to see at the Plaza de Americas, apart from the many pigeons. I walked back to the bus stop and the local shop owner was providing the entertainment while I waited for the next bus. The Plaza de España and Maria Luisa Park is free to access. Expect to spend one to two hours here. Boat hire and horse and cart rides are available. There are public toilets on site and various food stalls and the hop on hop off bus was 25 euros for 24 hour access. I then got off the bus at Plaza del Duque de la Victoria. Here you were introduced to a lovely area of town which is a shaded square with a statue of the Spanish artist Diego Velasquez, who was born in Seville. I took a short walk from the bus stop to the Musée de Bellas Artes de Sevilla, or the Museum of Fine Arts of Seville. This is the main art gallery in Seville which displays works from the Middle Ages, the Renaissance period, the Baroque era and up to the 20th century, exhibiting Spanish artists such as Francisco de Herrera, El Greco and of course Velasquez. The collection was very good with some beautiful pieces certainly leading heavily towards the Renaissance. The building itself is also very ornate and complements the art around it very well. Entry to the gallery is €1.50, but if you're from an EU country, it's free. You'll need to leave your bags in a free locker, and I'd expect to spend two to three hours here. One of the most iconic landmarks of Seville is the Metropole Parasol, known locally as Lesetas, or the Mushrooms. This extraordinary monument is the largest wooden construction in the world. Designed by the German architect Jürgen Mayer, it was completed in 2011. It is made of finished pine and for every tree used, three more were planted in the same forest. The Metropole Parasol is not just an architectural marvel, but a vibrant cultural space for both tourists and locals. When you visit, you can relax underneath in the shade using one of the many benches, or for a small fee, you can take the lift to the top walkway for panoramic views over Seville's historical old town, where you can see the cathedral, the Giralda, and the charming labyrinth of narrow streets. Included in the ticket is an immersive movie experience, which gives you sound, smells, and sensations from your seat. It takes 10 minutes and gives you a different look at the culture of Seville. I was also told that there's a light show in the evening when it gets dark, but unfortunately, as my time was limited, I will need to experience that another day. It's definitely worth a visit in the day or the night, and there is an I Love Seville sign which you can use for your selfies. Tickets for the walkway can be purchased online or at the door. Tickets include an immersive film experience of Seville. There is a light show in the evening, 
You can relax underneath the structure, which is absolutely free. And I would expect to spend one to two hours here. There are toilets on site and a vending machine with cold drinks and snacks. The Plaza del Torres is an iconic bullring that has played a significant role in Spain's history and traditions. Located in the heart of the city, the Plaza del Torres is one of the oldest and most renowned bullfighting arenas in Spain. With its Baroque facade, its history dates back to 1761 and it can hold up to 13,000 spectators. It is obviously a controversial sport which many don't feel should belong in a modern Spanish society but others see it as a part of a deep-rooted Spanish tradition which has helped to shape their country. Audience still attend the event, but some cities in Spain have now banned the practice. The Plaza del Torres Museum has a large collection of interesting historical posters, artworks, artefacts, costumes and memorabilia that shed light on the artistry and the controversy that surround this tradition. On the day of my visit, the arena was set up for a concert, but I could still certainly feel the atmosphere and imagine what it would be like during an event. The architecture of the arena was also very impressive. To visit here is certainly a personal choice. If you do decide to visit, if nothing else, it will educate you on the sport and give you a better understanding of the history behind it. Entry can be bought online or at the venue, I'd expect to spend one to two hours here. There are toilets on site. And please be mindful, bullfighting is a blood sport and you will see spears, swords and bull taxidermy. Today I joined an organised tour that took me to the awe-inspiring Italica Roman city, nestles just a stone's throw from Seville. Italica is a city with roots dating back to 206 BC and was a thriving Roman settlement that shaped the destiny of the Iberian Peninsula. It proudly claims to be the birthplace of not one, but two Roman emperors, the legendary Trajan and Hadrian. You start at the amphitheatre. As you step into the arena, you are immediately transported back in time as the ruins are so well preserved. Our guide said it could accommodate a staggering 25,000 spectators, which would rank it as one of the largest amphitheatres in the Roman Empire. Seeing the tunnels, the underground layer and seats, I really got a sense of what the life and noise would have been like. The town of Italica is further up the hill and its foundations are still very much there. You can see the outlines of the buildings, the remaining standing columns and well-preserved mosaics. You can even see the remains of the toilets. The whole place is a snapshot of ancient history, which is fascinating to see. In part two of our tour, I was taken to the Monastery of San Isidoro del Campo, located just outside Seville and 10 minutes away from the Roman city of Italica. This historical place dates back to the 14th century and showcases a blend of Christian and Islamic architecture, offering a further glimpse into the cultural and religious heritage of southern Spain. On the outside, the building looks very much like a castle, with its formidable walls and its thick wooden entrance gate. Inside, it feels very much like a church, with two very ornate Gothic chapels, along with Christian paintings, altarpieces and artefacts. You then walk out into a very quiet, sunny courtyard, which boasts a bell tower, a well and several frescoes. The monastery was a place of learning, a place of worship and a residence of Catholic monarchs when they visited Seville. Christopher Columbus also used the monastery as a place of solace while preparing for his voyage to the New World. It didn't take long to go round and it's well worth a visit, especially as it was part of the Italica tour. I joined an organised tour to the Italica and the San Isidoro del Campo Monastery, which included transport from Seville. 
The tour took about four to five hours, including transfers. There are toilets on site. And Italica is a very exposed area and rough to walk on in places. So I suggest bringing good walking shoes and sun protection. On being dropped into the city centre after the tour of Italica, I decided to venture to Las Duenos Palace, a small palace dating back to the 15th century. When you get to the door, you feel you're down a random back street, which you can't possibly have a palace in it. But when you enter the gate, you are greeted to a lush garden and a white building with unmistakably Andalusian architecture. The palace is still the home of Duke Carlos Fitz James Stuart, who heads the House of Alba. If that sounds Scottish, there is a royal connection here which you can learn about on the free audio tour. Las Duenos boasts a harmonious blend of architectural styles, from Gothic and Renaissance to Moorish and Baroque. As you step through its ornate gates, you'll find yourself surrounded by a beautiful garden, lush with greenery, a fountain, and orange trees. I was very happy to linger here. You then go into the main courtyard of the house where you can venture into the rooms, each showing the opulent interiors with artworks, treasures and various clothing. I really wasn't expecting much of this place, but I was so glad I went. I suggest this is a nice late afternoon venue where you can rest on a bench in the garden and just enjoy it. Tickets can be purchased online or at the door. There's a free audio tour, which is an app you can download. Expect to spend one to two hours here and make sure you spend time in the gardens because they are beautiful. The palace grounds are mostly flat and there are toilets on site. I think it's safe to say that I love Seville. I think this gem of a place is perfect for a short city break. It's probably one for adult couples or families with older children. There's a lot to see and plenty of nice restaurants and bars to explore throughout the city. I also found the place very wallet friendly. My hotel was in the Norvion district which was a 20 minute taxi ride from the airport and a 15 minute walk to the old town. Seville airport is very well connected around Europe and there's a very good high speed railway connecting to the city. As I found out, Seville is a very walkable city. There are of course buses, trams and a metro, but if you're here for a few days and staying near or in the old town, most of the key sites are within walking distance of one another. If you feel you need to use public transport, there are tourist cars for one or three days for either 5 euros or 10 euros. Seville does have a few options for a tourist pass which includes access to the Alcazar, Seville Cathedral and the Hop On Hop Off tours, which might save you some money. Details can be found in the Seville City Guide in the links below this video. I think I did most of the sites within 48 hours, but I would suggest spending 3 or 4 days in the city so you're not powering through it like I did, especially if you're thinking about going to Italica, which I would certainly recommend. Day trips from Seville are also something to explore, Granada, Cadiz and Gibraltar are all within distance. One thing to notice, I went in July and I was melting. My soft Scottish skin doesn't react well with the sun and I was caught up in one of the hottest days of the year where it reached 42 degrees C. If you turn into a sweaty puddle with rib bits like I do, I suggest a trip between October to April when it's a bit cooler. If you do go in summer, I would suggest getting an early start Get your sightseeing done in the morning and head for a nice lunch and a few cold drinks in the shelter in the afternoon. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of The Tourist Route. 
I hope you enjoyed the journey and found some inspiration for your next trip. If you liked what you watched, please give me a thumbs up and don't forget to share and hit that subscribe button so you don't miss more travel adventures coming to this channel. For an extra dose of travel tips, helpful links and a deeper dive into all the destinations I've covered, head over to thetouristroute.com.